Hello and welcome to Promenade Culture Center. This is Culture Corner. We bring you the authentic stories of creative individuals. Today, our guest is Dr. Shahad al Shamari, a literature professor and a writer. Dr. Shahad, welcome. Thank you so much. Very, Very happy, happy to have you here today. I'm really happy to be here too and talking to you. We like to start talking about the early childhood of our guests, hoping to find something very interesting and curious there in why today they are who they are. Yeah. Um, does your, did anything in your childhood craft the path yes. on which you are today? It's a good question because, like you said, um, we all have stories and we always have a funny story or a fun story. If you go back in history, there's always that moment when you realize Maybe I want to be an astronaut, maybe I want to fly, maybe I want to do this or that. And I think for me, I must have been maybe six or seven years old um, when I felt like I had a conflict. Mm. Uh, my mother was giving birth and uh, I was going to have a sister. And I felt unsure about that. I remember feeling, you know, curious, what does that mean? Am I mm. going to have to take care of her? Uh, does it mean I won't be the, you know, the only girl anymore? How is that going to change my life? And I'm pretty sure I didn't think that deeply about it, but I was frustrated and confused. And I remember my mom just saying, write a story. Maybe you can write her a story. So sometimes parents have these ways of getting you to accept change. And I think that was her way. She said, why don't you try and make it, make it actually natural, make it something mm. that you can actually show her later on. So I wrote a full book. It was a full story about how, you know, my mom is going to have a baby and I'm going to have a little sister. And um, I think I still have a copy somewhere. It was about 10, 15 pages with drawings and oh, you illustrated, know, illustrated too. to trying to make sense of, I think, mm, what was coming. A big change. And I was just excited to show it to her. And I think that must have been like my first you know, imagined reader. How would she read that? What would she think? So I think for all of us, we begin with a question of how do I deal with change? How do I deal with life? And for me, I didn't want to fly. I didn't want to be an astronaut. I just wanted to tell stories more than anything. School is usually a time where certain dreams are supported or sometimes they're crushed. Yeah, both. How did that look for you, uh, given that obviously very early on yeah. you aspire to writing and reading? So I think um, most English teachers, I've been lucky, most English teachers were very supportive. Um, I think I was privileged enough with uh, great schooling. Uh, mm. The teachers were very supportive at the time. Um, they wanted us to be able to, you know, voice our own uh, stories. We were always, we always had time for storytelling. We always had time to uh, show and tell. Even show and tell was a way for mm. us to narrate so I think I was really, really supported with that. Um, of course, there were times where I felt school was a bit uh, difficult. You know, some subjects had to be in a certain way. Creativity doesn't always go the way we want. Mm -hmm. But I learned very early on also uh, the idea of discipline. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of creatives, discipline can be difficult. You don't meet your deadlines. Um, you wait to be inspired. You wait to have that come to you. But I also learned to work with deadlines. So we would be allowed to write a story or to write um, a poem, but you had to submit on time. So I worked with feedback very quickly. Um, I learned to edit. I learned, you know, that my work wasn't always great. And I think a big part of um, creative work is learning that you actually need feedback more than anything else. So school was actually pretty, pretty supportive. Oh, that's great to hear. So the writer in you was born very early on. I think so. Did you continue to write after your first uh, a little novel for your sister. Absolutely, yes. Uh, there I mean, were... before you actually became a writer. <laughs> became a, yeah, I think that was the first kind of conflict. And then in middle school, there's always the conflict of, you know, uh, peer pressure, bullying, um, being amongst people of different uh, diverse nationalities, mm. trying to figure out who am I. So I wrote another book also about uh, school and about different groups at school and not really thinking, am I going to publish it or not? Mm. I remember it was just like in a notebook and I showed it to a few teachers, uh, to a few friends, to family members, but that was it. But the idea was always with conflict, writing was the way out. Mm. And I still wish people would really hear that, you know, with conflict, uh, writing, whether for the public or for yourself, mm. is one of the ways you can start to make sense of 
change, chaos, uh, difficulties in life. Mm. So as a teenager, I wrote quite a lot. I was introverted. So I think, you know, journaling was a big part of my world. Uh, writing stories, making up, you know, universes, uh, different um, fantasies, different experimental stuff, poetry. And I think a big part of it was this desire to, for me to just make sense of life, not to be you know, published or anything like that, just really to make sense of life. At that time, it was very therapeutic. Mm. It didn't cost anything. It was just for me. So, yeah. Uh, you write very openly about illness, including your own, own illness. Um, uh, I'd like us, if you uh, if you agree, to find that moment in time um, where you find out about yeah. your diagnosis. Has the decision of what you will study been uh, already uh, decided, made before yeah. that or together with such a great change in your life? So I think, you know, for, you know, people listening, uh, I have MS, multiple sclerosis, which is a neurological illness. It affects a lot of young people. And especially in Kuwait, there's a high, high incidence rate. Um, doctors don't really know why. It's not genetic. Um, it just happens. Interestingly, women tend to be affected more. Uh, I was only 18 years old. Uh, previously, I had no symptoms and I woke up one day unable to walk, mm. simply unable to walk. Uh, it was a sense of like paralysis of mm. the legs and the arms. The diagnosis pretty soon, I think it was about a month or two, mm. was this is going to be a lifelong illness and a disability, uh, sometimes an invisible dis disability and sometimes visible. So sometimes I will end up using a wheelchair, a cane, and sometimes I, I'm playing squash. Just two mm -hmm. very different images within the you know same person. I'm following on your squash career. Ah, okay, good. But, um, it's really interesting because as human beings, we don't think about mm. our bodies much. You know, we don't think that we have two or three sides to us, at least at the same time. Mm. Uh, with the diagnosis came an awareness that, you know, I do have a body. Mm. As a teenager, you don't really think about it. You're always, you know, running it's around. There. It's just there for me to do as I please with it. Uh, you know, part, I, it's just there for me for sports, for PE classes, um, to dress it up the way mm. I please. But you don't think about the limitations of mm. the body until you start aging or if you get sick. Um, mm. We start thinking about illness with the pandemic. We started really thinking about what does it mean to be sick or to have long-term fatigue. We never thought about that before. So as an 18-year-old, given that, you know, life-changing diagnosis, I think my first instinct was, okay, what now? Mm -hmm. Does it mean I don't have as much time? Uh, does it mean I'm going to die? All of these questions that, you know, didn't make any sense. Uh, so my initial plan was to actually go into medicine Mm. or to go into engineering to, you know, make my parents happy, mm. but also to do the right thing, the right career. And with the diagnosis, I felt like, okay, since I don't have uh, that much time to be healthy and to be me, they were telling me the disease was like a ticking clock, mm -hmm. that things would get worse within five to 10 years. I might never have a job. So I decided then let me just study literature, which is something I really loved just never really thought that I could mm. turn into a career. So, you know, when they tell you, you know, if you had you know, one day or one week to live, what choices would you make? As cliche as it sounds, it's actually really accurate. Mm. Um, you start realizing, you know, what do you want to do with your life? Who do you really love? Who are you? Mm. When you feel that pressure of life, your, you know, basic instincts kick in. And I think for me, my instinct was I will choose what I really want to do. I was not thinking about a career. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about just, you know, the process of learning. What am I curious about? Do I want to study about medicine or do I want to study about how medicine is represented in stories? Mm -hmm. Two completely different things. And I was really, really, um, I think also looking to see uh, where does disability fit in literature? Mm. I hadn't seen any characters growing up who were sick. Mm. I didn't see any girls who were sick at all. Um, I Very didn't... healthy, pretty girls only. <laughs> only, right, in Disney. Um, so I didn't know what kind of narrative that would mm. be. And I think all of this curiosity just pushed me to study what I really wanted to study. And I enjoyed it very, very much. Um, again, at that point of, you know, struggling with illness, uh, struggling with depression, 
studying made me happy mm-hmm. and it sounds very nerdy but actually it was because it was the choice that I wanted more than anything I felt I was taking control of my life mm-hmm. in a way that illness had you know taken me away from life more than anything I was thinking a lot about what sayings we have in different languages yeah that relate to how our bodies are presumed healthy yeah. always. Yeah. For instance, in Serbian, which is my mother tongue, yeah. um, there is a saying, when you want to say that something has become sustainable, you say it, it stands on two legs. Yes. Or in Latin, we say men sana in corpore sano. So a healthy yeah. mind healthy in a healthy body. body. We have it in Arabic too, yeah. So <laughs> how many of these actually deceive us? Uh, and we don't we don't ponder these yeah. until there is a change with our body. Absolutely. Um, did you find uh, you said that that reading growing up there were not a lot of characters? Are there authors who write about disability and illness today, uh, locally, regionally, or are you still kind of a lone voice? <laughs> So I think I've started something. Um, a lot of people now are interested in, in writing about disability, at mm-hmm. least through poetry. They're writing about mental health, which I feel is a big part is of... Is there stigma Definitely. I think mm. there's still a lot of stigma when it comes to um, not just women talking about illness, but when you talk about the body. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of this image still of ideal femininity, you know, having the perfect look, the perfect hair, the perfect body, um, You know, you don't necessarily see a lot of women out there uh, with, you know, at least in, in a wheelchair. I remember, you know, being in a wheelchair and being stared at uh, and hearing comments such as, you know, you should just stay at home mm. uh, from people who I didn't expect that from uh, using a cane and being told, you know, maybe you shouldn't play soccer, making mm. the assumption that it's a sports injury, not necessarily uh. an illness. Um, so I think there is, there's still a lot of stigma with how we talk about the body. And it's very interesting you say, you know, all of these phrases, all of these sayings. Even in Arabic, we have a lot of sayings that can be very stigmatizing to someone who's struggling with, you know, a disability or an illness. I used to think, what does that mean, healthy mind and a healthy body? Mm. What if the mind is affected? Mm. Does that mean my body is unhealthy? Or is it the other way around? Is my body actually unhealthy, but my mind is as sharp as ever? Which mm-hmm. one is it? And I think always this dichotomy of what's more important. We mm. place a lot of emphasis on the mind being, you know, superior, excellent. What happens when it's hurt, when it's damaged, when it's uh, struggling? And that takes us also into mental health Um, I see a lot of young poets now writing about mental health. Um, there's quite a few people who are, you know, openly writing about it. I haven't seen anything like a memoir yet or something mm. that's nonfiction. I think we have a long way to go, but I'm hopeful that now we're beginning to talk about it. Ten years ago, there was nothing out there, uh, not even in Arabic. I was looking in English and in Arabic. I wanted to see... You know, somebody being able to challenge this notion of this is a body that should be silenced, uh, that is shameful. Mm. I couldn't find anything. You have written a memoir. You are a prolific writer. But your you. last book, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, Head Above Water. And it says reflections on illness. Yeah. And it is very raw, very open, detailed even, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but written with such grace and easiness this is my my Opinion. own uh, take from from i i read it um i feel in uh, in a few hours honestly um so you're championing this um how did this come to be this book is this something that was waiting for years yeah to be out there did you also feel the need that you have to put something such such a text out there for a public to see Absolutely. I mean, Head Above Water was, I think, at least a 10-year journey. Mm. Um, I started with a blog. At that time, back in the day, blogging was the way to go. Mm. So I was blogging, you know, almost daily, not just about my experience with MS or illness, but also about society, how people were responding uh, to illness. I had a lot of friends also in the in the um, d- disabled community. So I was able to see things that I had been, you know, uh, ignorant of mm. previously. So I started writing about How do we um, have access in, in education for people with disabilities? Do we uh, understand what it means to have, you know, d- different learning styles? Do we mm. even understand what it's like 
to to not be able to carry your own bag to school. There's a lot of things I was writing about at the time, and I had some readers for that blog. And the more I wrote, the more I understood that there was kind of engagement. People mm-hmm. were engaging. And I decided to keep writing, uh, but to put it in a book style. Instead, you know, taking these blog entries, I was also keeping a journal for nearly 10 years about the diagnosis mm-hmm. and about teaching and about, uh, I was trying to really keep track of everything that was happening. I was told that my memory would be affected and I started to lose track of important things. So I wanted to document everything. So when COVID hit, I remember this was a time I was uh, stuck at home like many of us. Mm. And I realized I can put this all together. And I did. I put this together within the two year, I think it was a two year frame and uh, submitted it to lots of publishers. It was rejected by so many publishers. And then eventually... I'm sure they're very (laughs) sad now. It was really interesting because the question was, who is this book for? Mm. Is it going to be for the Western audience? Is it going to be for an Arab audience? Is it just for people with illnesses and disabilities? Who is the target audience? From a marketing perspective, you understand those questions. Oh, yes. Of course. But uh, from a literary perspective, for me, the idea was I wanted to put the work out there so that it, it would be documented uh, as, you know, maybe some sort of reference uh, for some 18 year old looking at some point to, to you know, cite something mm-hmm. out there to reflect on her own journey or his own journey about illness or even mental health and be able to see some sort of representation. Uh, when I was really young, I couldn't find that anywhere. And when I did my PhD thesis, I was looking everywhere mm. for a book about illness and a woman living with it, not tragically being killed off yes. if it was fiction. And so I think it was more like an activist urge more than anything. A lot of people think memoir writing is just about me, me, me. Mm. But even the word memoir is about memory. Mm. And memory can be collective memory. It can be uh, personal memory. So I was documenting not just my memories, but also, um, you know, the invasion of Kuwait, what that had to do with with how we responded to Mm. it, our bodies, our minds, trauma. So I think the memoir is just um, my contribution, I think, to the mm. the way I think about it, to my community. And hopefully... The response is great to the book. It's really good to hear. Yeah, and from really what great. I've read and researched, uh, I felt personally, it felt like the book spoke to me. I could relate to so many things. Yeah. I don't live with, uh, with an illness, yeah. but it still spoke to me on so many levels. Yeah. And I realized in a, in a number of your books I've read... Um, that this complete honesty gets me always, every yeah. time. Yeah. It uh, it simply overflows every emotion yeah. um, and every thought we have about the book. And that's, I think this is what people respond to. Yeah. Um, we are constantly lied to. That's true. Yeah. And there is <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of phony and fake around us. And yeah. then just someone who speaks so openly and, and with such honesty, um, that means a lot. I think that's a big part of what I'm trying to foster in the community. Mm. Like you said, we're lied to most of the time. You see perfect images on social mm. media, perfect womanhood, perfect femininity, a uh, perfect mind that does not mm. struggle with anxiety or depression and so on. And vulnerability is what we are missing. Mm. And I think we keep teaching our kids and we keep teaching in schools and we keep teaching even from uh, the way we write, you know, it's to write rigidly, to write academically. Mm. Uh, Do not cry, do not show weakness. You're strong, you got this, you got this, which is all beautiful. But I think we do forget our very simple, vulnerable, humane side. Mm. Uh, And in I feel in in writing, a big part of it is vulnerability. Mm being able to reach this random person on the other side, uh, this reader who's looking for themselves. They're not looking to read about me. No one is really looking to read about the other. You're usually looking for yourself in books. Mm. And if you can find at least one image of yourself or Mm. maybe one feeling, one emotion, that's when you start to feel connected to to the person, to, to the words. And then you take it with you. You never take back the image of the author. You take back the book Or even the emotion that you felt, did I read it in an hour? Mm. Did I struggle to get through? Mm. Um, How did I feel after finishing it? Uh, Did did I hate it? Did I love it? And if so, why? 
we will come back to the book uh, more. I wanted to ask you um, the teaching after after you finished uh, uh, college. Uh, was that a natural path? Yes, absolutely. Mm. I think I realized um, also because the clock was ticking, mm. I still felt the clock was ticking. I felt that I wanted to teach even if for free. At that point, I was saying, you know, it doesn't matter. I just want to be able to be part of that journey for others, not just for myself. Uh, for me, teaching became a primary role. It mm -hmm. was how I defined myself, you know, not uh, just as, you know, Shahad, who's a writer or, or who has a love for literature. I just wanted to be an educator more mm -hmm. than anything in the classroom, within the walls of the classroom, and to, to be able to have at least a bit of change within these students. And I saw that very early on. I was very young when I started teaching. Mm -hmm really young, which was also um, a bit difficult, you know, to establish authority. Mm. Uh, I was also teaching university students, so they're 18, 19. And at a very challenging place because yeah. you had, the, the students were, were separated older. and uh, yes, right? yes. Uh, men and women had yeah. different classes. There was segregation and, at yes. the time and a lot of them were older than me. Mm. And I think I really wanted to make an impression. So mm. I really tried to befriend them, but also to have that balance of establishing authority. And it taught me quite a lot about different learning styles, uh, about also how you carry yourself with different people, with diversity. I, you know, had previously no experience at all. Mm -hmm. All I had was a love for books and a love for literature, but no previous training in curriculum or in education. This was real life. It was real mm -hmm. life, very different. And not everybody loved literature. That was a oh, big part of, of it. And I think that was my realization. You don't necessarily deal with people who mirror you all the time. Mm. We wish we could deal with people who are just like us or mirrored our, our belief systems. But I realized very quickly I would come, you know, head to head with lots of people who didn't see what I was saying, and that was fine. I remember uh, a person who most influenced my life. That was my literature teacher in oh, high excellent. school. <laughs> uh, I went to a very specific high school because this was school for humanities, languages, linguistics, and so on. But the students were all very, well, I mean, I was one of them, but I, I swear all of my friends were just pure geniuses, <laughs> very talented students. Yeah. Uh, who were actually very talented in sciences as well and in so many other subjects. Yeah. But they chose literature, linguistics and, and uh, languages, translation and so on. And our teacher, who was a very tough woman, <laughs> and we will never forget her, but she has influenced so many of our decisions and gave us this strength and hope. This is how I always see literature teachers and yeah. professors. <laughs> that will never change, I think, because it is it feels a very tough job, but also so rewarding at the same time. And she said one thing that I loved. She said, "You can um, you can analyze characters, which means you must be great at math as well. There's <laughs> no way a yeah. person who can analyze a text." Yeah is not someone who can really do anything, anything that comes to your mind. Um, so on that note, I'm wondering, um, you've mentioned uh, uh, briefly, but how much are you a leader mm. in the classroom mm. and how much you try to just kind of live next to these young beings who are just at the beginning of their own independent lives? Well, I think it's beautiful that you remember your teacher. <laughs> that's always really nice you remember her. And I think that's what's really important, that you remember the line she said, you remember mm. the words, you, you carry that. You don't necessarily remember every single day mm. or the exams or maybe the questions on the exams, but you do remember that connection. Oh, I remember her tough tests. Oh, remember <laughs> It's, it's always interesting because, again, people have all these different sides to mm. them. She had tough tests, but she also was tough, but she also gave you hope, but she gave you the sense of you can do really anything. And that's the balance I try to strike. Mm. I'm, I don't think I am a leader. I think I'm a guide. Mm. And I think I do guide them into literature, but also to look at themselves. Where are they uh, in their in their journeys? We mm. talk a lot, not just about the books uh, that we read, but we always relate it to what about you today? Why is reading Shakespeare even relevant today? Um, how is Romeo and Juliet similar to Quaidy society? And mm. then they laugh initially. But then we start really talking about um, difference, family names, what does that really mean? Uh, how do I define myself in terms of the community, but also where do I belong? So I think I'm 
constantly guiding, uh, but also waiting to see that spark or waiting to see a voice that challenges me. And there's a lot of that also in class. Uh, we do have very open discussions. I think I am really one who believes in discipline. Also, I would be probably tough. Uh, I think I'd be described as that. Uh, having discipline, I think, is so important mm. if you want anything in life whether you want to be a writer or you want to be a business owner or you want to sell something, you have to have discipline. You can be a creative genius all you want, mm. but if you don't meet your deadlines, you disappoint people, you lose your customer, you lose the people who you're trying to uh, make an impression on. Mm. Uh, so I'm pretty strict, I think, with deadlines. I'm not teaching them about the exam or about the research paper, but just how do I manage to deal with life? Mm. It's life lessons all along more than anything. How do you balance your work as a professor and uh, your life as a writer? Yeah, well, they're very similar, but also very different. It's hard to balance, to be honest. It's it's a journey um, where, you know, I've written Head Above Water and now I'm unable to write anything else. I've been just constantly in a state of teaching and in a state of, uh, you know, doing other things, but not writing at the moment. Mm. I do keep a journal still. I do journal. I believe it's a big part of life in general to reflect and to think about where I am right now. Uh, but it's it's hard to be able to have that creativity, but also to follow rules and abide within the educational system and academia. Uh, we're also required to publish different kind of style of, of work in academia. It is not creative. Mm. Uh, there has to be a sense of, uh, you know, again, discipline. So I think that balance for me. I try to be as engaged as possible within the writing community in you know, various work that I do, uh, but I'm currently not writing. Hmm. Well, we are looking forward to anything new that will come. But at the same time, I think it's a luxury you can afford yourself yes. at the moment to um, to write when the time is right. right. Absolutely, yes. Um, what is the role of a writer in today's world? You have mentioned that um, to deal with a lot of uh, a lot of things happening to us that are frustrating and uh, that are not initially positive. Um, writing and reading can help. Um, now, the world is very polarized. And um, with everything happening currently in the world, um, somewhere in the end of the last year, I was talking to uh, my colleagues and um, saying we must do more cultural activities. Mm -hmm. We must engage children more. Now is the moment yeah. not to stop the activities. Yeah. But to engage them more in reading, in writing, yeah. in having, making contacts with people, not their nationality, not their religion. Um, and um, my kids sometimes say, not everything is in books, but <laughs> I do believe that yeah. all truths yeah. are in the books. Yeah. Um, and uh, w do you see yourself uh, with a role as a writer yeah. uh, in somehow, if not rectifying the world, then supporting the the, the 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 light in the world. I think it's really important. You know what you say is everything is in books. I I think so too. There's a lot of great truths in books and universal ideas that you know no matter the the year we're at or or what's going on in the world, you can always look back and look for justice. You can look for peace. Mm -hmm. You can look for revenge. You can look for these really key concepts in in life. Mm -hmm. I think the writer, of course, is always needed, but perhaps now even more than ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, poetry. Poets are writing about, you know, horrific uh, wars that are happening. There's a sense of, of course, how do I document pain? How do I uh, document uh, trauma, a genocide? How do I write about all of mm. that for future generations? And that's what's happening. Writers are now documenting more, more than ever, not just fiction, but nonfiction. So I think nonfiction is now even more powerful than mm. ever. Um, it's a historical you know, moment that we're in. And that's when the writer comes in. Um, I think also a writer should be able to kind of, like you say, make connections mm. with everything that's happening, create uh, empathy or foster empathy for people who would otherwise not connect um, so if you read, for example, Palestinian literature today, you don't read about the genocide, you read about family, you mm. read about love, you read about home. About the, land. Uh, yeah, uh, 
plants exactly. from that plant. So nothing yeah. exactly 100% political, mm. but it's personal. Mm. And again, th- that personal is vulnerability, is political also. It's just not uh, in your face and which could turn off some people. Of course, I uh, was very proud. I am very proud of a lot of writers I know, especially writers, obviously, who come from a background I am from, who yeah. have stood up yeah. to what is going on, who have refused their residences in yeah. the countries that have been supportive, wow. yeah. um, that have actually, in a way, supported genocide yeah. or enabled yeah. it and so on. And we know how writers live. Yeah. Not a lot of writers can easily live off no. of their writing. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, yeah. So we know that refusing a residency uh, in a very important institution, uh, leaving a job position means a lot. And um, I tremble when I read these stories, but they are so honest and they are powerful. They are brave, but also what is brave if not being honest uh, at the time when you really have to be? Uh, So I feel like the writers and... uh, no one can own literature. Yeah. I think that's uh, that's what we've seen nowadays. Yeah. And the writers have really uh, uh, been the heroes of, of, of our time, I, I would feel, yeah. among other people, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you go back in history and, you know, the poet's job was also always to document mm. history more than anything, even through oral poetry. You know, the job was to tell us what's happening, make sense of the events. And before they were even writing, before people were even literate, Mm. that was the idea to document history and human emotion. Um, I wanted to uh, to discuss another platform that uh, you have been, you have many, many (laughs) uh, different careers, but all around the same beautiful uh, topic of writing. Um, We at the center work with you, uh, not enough, To be honest, we need to rectify that. But uh, we hold a workshop uh, or organize a workshop that you hold um, on writing um, uh, called Writing to Heal. At least this is what we have uh, adopted. And uh, uh, recently I've seen that um, your initiatives have grown into a platform literary mentor. Uh, can you tell us more about it? And uh... Absolutely. Well, I love working mm-hmm. with you and the PCC. It's always really fun. Uh, it's a great community that we get to, to. I get to meet a lot of wonderful people. And I think that's what it's all about at the end of the day. So the Literary Mentor is my uh, personal initiative. It's a creative platform. I am offering not just workshops on how to write, but also how can I even reflect on whatever I'm going through, whether it's a life um, transition, Mm. uh, retirement, um, uh, changes in life, marriage, a disability, and how we can use writing and journaling creatively, but Mm. also effectively. So not just writing just for the sake of writing, but also asking the right questions. So my role as the literary mentor, uh, and I thank my students for that, they gave me the title of mentor. They've always said, you know, you've been a mentor. And for me, when I started reflecting on that word, the idea is to simply guide, not to really educate or teach one correct way of doing something, but just to be there as the person comes to their own Mm. um, voice or their own recognition. So writing to heal uh, basically takes a lot of uh, therapeutic techniques uh, that are part of journaling and reflective writing, but specifically writing from the body. So again, it goes back to my uh, work on disability and and disability studies. When you're writing from the body, you are writing more vulnerably, more openly. You're not writing from the mind. You're not just writing your thoughts down and that's it. It does involve uh, being more present. It involves um, uh, just a connection to your to your heart, to even what feels wrong in your stomach. Uh, how do I describe it without saying butterflies in my stomach? How mm. can I actually go against cliches that we tend to use? Um, It means listening to your body. Um, If you're going to be healing, so to speak, then you're also going to be listening to your body. Uh, For me, writing has always been a big part of my healing journey, uh, emotionally, physically, spiritually, you name it. And so I use uh, writing to heal for all age groups. Uh, It tends to be for people around 18 and above, because that's a time where we get to really reflect on, you know, our bodies and our minds. It's interesting. I tend to get a lot of 
different uh, people with different needs. So someone might be, you know, joining the workshop because they want to look at mental health. Mm. Others want to look at um, just how can I write better as, as somebody who journals quite a lot. Mm. It works for everybody. Um, again, it's all about you. It's not necessarily about, you know, defining what is writing to heal. But what does it mean for you? How do you write to heal? Uh, there's a few other workshops using poetry sometimes, uh, using nonfiction sometimes. Uh, how do I even begin to write a memoir? Why is my story even important? Mm. And those are called life stories or life narratives. How do I narrate a life? And we work through all of these techniques. These circles, um, how do you achieve a safe circle and people to actually share? Yeah. So a big part of this uh, kind of circle is the safe space or safe community. Uh, usually the people who actually come are readers who are very respectful of the other. Uh, there's no judgment. I really, you know, lay it out very clearly where if you want to share, you can. If you don't wish to share, it makes you anxious. You're also safe. You don't mm -hmm. have to. You won't be judged for not sharing. Usually people end up very comfortable. Uh, we work uh, peer to peer, one on one mm. first. So you pick somebody in the group who you don't necessarily know. You get to share your work with them. They give you feedback, not critical feedback, but I also work with how do I give feedback that is not constructive feedback. Mm. It's not critical feedback. It's just I read that. Thank you for sharing. I listened to your vulnerability. I was able to feel it without really trying to correct anyone or make it right. Um, and I think that's what really people need more than anything. Like you say, it's that safety mm. that we don't necessarily find even in school. Yes. Oh, true. I, I have three <laughs> children, so I know how it looks in school. Yeah. A lot of our time is actually dedicated to somehow protecting children from yeah. what's going yeah. on at school, Absolutely. even uh, in that relation, teacher and student. Um, I know you also um, hold these book discussions. Um, there is a, a book, uh, a topic on the table, and then people gather and discuss the book, the yeah. like a book club. Mm -hmm. This is also a form of, uh, I guess, of, of uh, sharing vulnerability and learning about Absolutely, it. Absolutely, yeah. So it's quite a versatile uh, um, approach yeah. to, uh, to these workshops. Um, coming back to your latest book, The Memoir, um, do you still hold uh, book promotions? Do you still meet with your readers? Um, is it more online? Is it in person? Do you travel for it? How does that part of the life of a writer look? Yeah. And uh, is it difficult? It is. is it taking a toll? <laughs> I think it's one of the things people don't talk about, actually. Um, as a writer, you have to constantly promote your work. So uh, the publisher asks you to do promotions. Um, so there's a lot of self-promotion involved. You do need to talk to people. You need to listen to them. Um, I do go on Goodreads sometimes. I have a look what's out there. I do travel for book readings uh, still actually uh, quite a lot. I was just in Abu Dhabi for a book mm. reading. So usually there's a reading and then there's a book signing. Sometimes people just want to talk again and be listened to. They don't necessarily have questions as much as people want to say, hey, you know, I feel the same uh, or, you know, my sister also has so and so and is stuck at home, is hiding at home or is hidden at home. Sometimes you have people who will tell you, you know, there's so much stigma mm. that, you know, I wish my sister or my brother would actually read the book. Mm. So it's a beautiful and rewarding feeling. But there's a sense of constantly being aware that the book has left an, an impact and continues to on others. And I have no idea, you know, how far it extends. Mm -hmm. uh, some people will send emails, they're shy, so they will send you a message, uh, direct message and email. And there's still that sense of uh, the reader talking back, I guess, to, to, to the book. Is it easy to let the book go? To, in a way, yeah. leave it to readers who might even dissect it damage in a negative it manner and damage it. Yes, yes. I think um, most writers will say the same. Maybe it's a cliche answer, but they will say, or I say, it's it's 
it's gone outside of, into the world, kind of like you with your kids, you know, at some point, you know, they do have to go off to, you know, college and then you won't know what's really happening there mm. the whole time, who they will meet, who, will, who they will talk to. The same thing with the book, you really don't know where it lands or who it begins to talk to, who dissects it. Um, when I was uh, just starting out, I remember negative reviews, I would be really upset. And now I just re recognize it's a big part of mm. not being able to control what happens once the book is out there. Mm. Uh, it's very hard to let it go. Um, but there are, you know, steps I take, you know, I don't check Goodreads as much. Uh, if there's a review, I don't necessarily read it anymore. But there is a sense of also these quick, short conversations that I have with readers, and that leaves a huge imprint. It leaves a huge effect on me. Somebody has read it, somebody has loved it. Um, you're proud of the work, but there's also a sense of recognizing it's on its own. Mm. Um, I tell my students sometimes, don't ask me about the book. Uh, right now, this is me, your teacher, your educator. Mm. Um, the author is dead, and then they'll start laughing. But I'll say, no, seriously, the author is not here. You don't have access to the author. Yeah. So you are free to imagine whatever you would like, make your own assumptions, make your own decisions, come to your own conclusions. Um, because I teach them, I guess, and I'm in the classroom, sometimes they'll ask me why th this ending and not that, what happens to so-and-so in the book? And the response is always just leave the book on its own. Mm. It becomes also a part of the reader. Um, sometimes people find things that I never even thought about. True. Um we will use the opportunity that you're here to ask you to share um, an insight or an advice for someone who is pondering over a piece of paper, maybe with a pencil in his hand yeah. or her hand. <laughs> and look at me now, completely old fashioned thinking <laughs> of writing um, or maybe typing. What would be your advice for someone who really wants to start uh, writing? I think, and I, I say this quite a lot because uh, we hear this quite a lot. People are very protective of their writing, which is very normal. Um, we're very afraid of how people will receive it. But we're also very defensive of how people react. Mm -hmm. A big part of writing is recognizing that it will not necessarily be received the way you would like it to be. So someone might actually pick it up and say, I don't understand anything you've written here. Mm. What's going on in the story? And instead of feeling defensive or being really upset and throwing the book away and probably even the person away saying, you know, I never want to hear from them again. This openness, you need to start working on it. Mm. Um, it's one thing to say I'm open to feedback, but it's another to actually put it into action. Mm. It hurts, but it shouldn't kill the writer either. It definitely hurts, but that idea of learning to live with that pain of noticing my writing is not perfect. It's mm. not a great ending. Um, it's not as exciting as I thought. My poetry isn't that beautiful. For a lot of poets, it really hurts. Oh, yeah. Again, it is your, your baby in many ways. So I think receiving being open to ask also different people, uh, not just my best friend who will or my mother who will tell me the work is great, but also, you know, sharing with different groups, um, being open to people saying I didn't understand helps me because I will rewrite and make it more suitable for, for another reader. So having a peer reviewer, find another writing buddy, find another person who is not your friend and begin to work with them. It, it really makes a difference. Thank you for that. Uh, what is in plans for you? Well, at the moment, I'm working on the Literary Mentor. That's mm. the big, big platform. Mm. Um, we do have the Reading Circle. Uh, it takes up a lot of time, but it's also really rewarding. Mm. I do hope to, you know, go back to writing one day. But for now, I'm just, you know, taking a, I mean, not a break, but working with the community more mm. than, than my usual. And um, a question that we ask some um, or all of our guests, yeah. uh, depending in which area they work, what is something a reader shouldn't miss? What are you reading? What would you suggest? Um, anything, anything really? That's good. Yes. So I think uh, there's a book called Evil Eye mm. by Ita Frum. She's a Palestinian author, mm. a Palestinian American author. The book is a novel and it deals with uh, mother daughter relationships. Mm but also about the Palestinian uh, diaspora, uh, mm. looks at uh, Palestine as 
just, you know, a political cause right now, but also looks at the motherland, what it means um, to be connected to your mother, uh, not land, but also your mother, to your sense of language, your sense of identity, mm. and also be living, you know, she lives abroad, the character lives abroad, so she's quite westernized, mm. but also trying to find the sense of belonging. So Evil Eye is quite a bestseller right now, mm. given the current climate, but it's definitely a book to read. Um, she has another book, um, I think it's called A Girl Is Not a Man, something along those lines. Eat mm. Off Room, she's a beautiful writer. Uh, there's also Hello Beautiful, and it's by Anne Napolitano. She's uh, really a, a beautiful writer who works with family also. All of her novels are about family, what it means to forgive family. And if you think about it, we all have a lot of family to forgive. It's very common. Mm. Uh, so her writing will touch on, you know, many different themes that we can all relate to. And it's called Hello Beautiful. Uh, I think it was on Oprah's, um, you know, best books list. Mm. And it's it's a bit of a long read, but it's a, it's a must for me. That book really was very, very beautiful in, in terms of how it talked about forgiveness. Do we have to forgive? Mm. Um, is it really for me if I forgive my sister or my brother or is it really for them or do I have to forgive them because they're my sister or my brother those are the main questions with it do you still suggest Shakespeare not all the time no mm. not really um, I teach when I say it. still I mean <laughs> given that you teach yeah Yes, that you lecture on Shakespeare. No, I don't. I don't actually suggest uh, Shakespeare for a general reader who's mm. interested in in books that you know might affect them. Mm. Um, I want people to read because they're searching for something that they love. Mm. So a big part of what I do is also I kind of study the person that I'm talking to. Mm. I get to see what are their interests. If you have one shot at, at you know getting them to read the book don't want to you know misplace oh, yes. my shot of course. and lose by saying you know hey read Romeo and Juliet and then mm. they'll say I hate it and then they never pick up a book again I had a situation with my son the other oh. day because <laughs> he read um, so when I was a child and when I was asked what my favorite activities I would always say reading and in a very in very vulnerable years when no one would find it you know cool and yeah. hip to read, nope. I would say reading. And I would still say that. And I listened to one of your interviews and you said, I loved reading. I still read a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as, as this is something that stops over the years for a lot of people. Yeah. But uh, this is my main source of energy, so I still do it. And uh, the kids in British in British schools, they do a lot of um, Michael Murpurgo books, yeah. which are not always... I remember reading some of these very yeah. sad style of books <laughs> when your horse dies and your dog yeah. dies. And it's really on some children, that's very difficult. Hard. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to see whether he would like to read one of... Um, another book by the same author. And he said, please, please, not just not this kind of books. Oh, yeah, the genre And then found the something that's, a, you know, a, a series, an almanac, something that's more on a comic side, that's but still anything really, just to kind of keep them engaged in books, their little noses in books. Yeah, I think it's more challenging today, mm. actually, to convince anyone, um, mm. especially the younger generation, that yeah. this is going to be interesting. Um, I think very carefully before I suggest mm. anything to to uh, you know a reader or somebody who wants to even explore reading. Mm. I'll ask them, you know, what do you like? What do you watch as as a mm. genre? Do you like fantasy? Uh, do you are you interested in witches or vampires or you know that's the start. But mm. I never just go to the classics immediately. Yes, of course. Yeah. Well, this was a lovely conversation and Thank the time you, uh, flew very, very uh, swiftly. Um, we hope to see you very soon back at Culture Corner and here at Promenade Culture Center. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you, Xenia. Appreciate it. Thank you.